Welcome to A Word Fitly Spoken, a podcast about Jesus, His Word, and our joy in following Him. I'm Michelle Leslie. And I'm Amy Spreeman. And in this episode of our annual interview series, Holy Habits for the New Year, uh, you know, because New Year's resolutions do fizzle out, and we want to encourage you to develop lasting holy habits in your walk with the Lord. So last year, if you'll recall, and if you didn't, go back and listen, but our focus was on personal holy habits. And this year's holy habits are really more outwardly focused on ministering to other people, or in this case tonight, advocating for or others. In our first episode of Holy Habits 2024, we talked with Pastor Travis McNeely about biblical counseling and how you can get involved. Well, tonight we're talking about a hugely important topic, and that is abortion abolition. That's right, Amy. And we're taking the time to talk about abolition this week because this coming Sunday, January 21st, is National Sanctity of Life Sunday. We've talked about abolition several times on the show because it's literally a matter of life and death. But tonight, we're going to talk specifically about how Christian women can get involved in abolishing abortion. And we've got a special guest here with us tonight to help us learn about that. Susan White has been involved in the abolition movement for quite a while and she runs the Abolition Women account over on X, or formerly known as Twitter, to give abolitionist women a voice, to advocate for preborn babies, and to encourage women across the country to get involved in abolition. Susan, welcome, and thanks for coming on the show today. Can you tell us a little bit about yourself? Yes, and thanks for having me. So my name is Susan And by the grace of God, I was saved out of false conversion in 2017. So even though I grew up in the church my whole life, I've just been a true Christian for about five years. Um, I've been married for 14 years and so far have one child in heaven and one child on earth here with us who's seven years old. I'm an identical twin, which I live less than a quarter mile from. And so we are homeschooling families and we have a lot of fun Um, with my son and her kids and everything that that kind of life brings. So I can tell that you're not from Wisconsin, Susan. Uh, Remind us, where where are you from? No, I live in Tennessee, even though my brother lives in Wisconsin. So he's not too (laughs) far from you. But I was uh, born and raised here in southeast Tennessee. So. Oh, excellent. Well, for our listeners who don't know, Susan, (laughs) what's the difference between being pro-life and being an abortion abolitionist? Well, that is a great question. And when I get asked pretty frequently because abolitionism is on the rise, I like to say most people don't have never even heard of it. They just assume, you know, pro-life is pro-life, pro-abortion is pro-abortion. And that's the two options that you have. But there is a um, truly foundationally differences between the pro-life movement and the abortion abolition movement. The primary one being that the pro-life movement is built on a secular foundation And the abolitionist movement would be built on the word of God. And so how this plays out, you know, if you're talking with a pro-lifer generally about this issue, they will talk about and say, you know, abortion is wrong and abortion is violent. And science tells us that human life begins at fertilization and all human beings should have rights. Do you believe in human rights? And they go on from there, from that foundation. Whereas abolitionists are saying we are humans from the moment of fertilization and every human is made in the image of God. God says thou shalt not murder and that he hates those that shed innocent blood and that he demands that we establish justice for the fatherless and not use in equal weight to measures or partiality and judgment. So everything we would say would be off of a biblical foundation instead of a secular foundation, because we believe that science is, is great and there are great things science tells us, but science is not what changes hearts and minds. It is the word of God going forth that changes hearts and minds on anything. Mm -hmm. Yes. And then the other difference, these are the two that I normally say, is in pro-life. Now, this would be in like the legislative realm, the legal realm. The pro-life establishment, the lobbyists, the politicians, they support those types of things. They will only support legislation that would regulate abortion as health care. So saying who, where, when, how, you know, with what and who you can hold accountable for killing a child. And the abolitionists are only willing to regulate abortion as homicide because homicide 
and abortion are the same thing. It's the killing of a human being, an image bearer of God. And so the way that this pays out, because it sounds odd when people hear this for the first time, because they hear in the pro-life movement, abortion isn't health care, abortion's not health care. And they hear the pro-abort say that abortion is health care, abortion is health care. But when you look legislatively, the only bills that the pro-life movement is interested in passing are those that regulate abortion. Um, I even saw a post today from a pro-life group in Missouri because they had a bill filed that would treat humans in the womb the same as humans outside of the wombs as far as murder goes. And he was bragging because the pro-life movement put so much pressure on that legislature in Missouri that he withdrew his bill and they were bragging about it. And so you know, there there really is a huge difference when it comes to legislation about what pro-lifers are doing and are willing to do and what abolitionists are not willing to do based on the word of God who says don't compromise with child sacrifice. So, Right. So this really is coming at it more from a biblical perspective, a Christian, a uniquely Christian perspective. So that that's really good. And I think that's that's really what our our listeners are are looking for, you know, to 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 join in with and to support. I think one of the things that some Christians haven't realized yet, though, is that uh, abortion didn't automatically become illegal in every state when Roe versus Wade was struck down in 2022. So some of our listeners, you know, as they're trying to think about this biblically, they might be thinking also at the same time, why is it so urgent that I get involved in abortion abolition now that Roe is is over? Can you help us understand why abortion has actually increased since Roe and why it's vital to continue the fight against abortion? Yes. And so there is a reason that people think there are states where it is illegal and that it is abortion free. For example, I saw Students for Life, which is one of the largest pro-life groups two days ago, put out an infographic that said we've, you know, um, ended abortion in 14 states. We have 36 to go. But that is not true because abortion is actually still legal um, in all 50 states and legal for the pregnant woman until birth in all 50 states. And I was looking at some of the numbers because abortion rates, they are increasing, which a lot of people don't know. So in 2016, there were 874,000 abortions that were reported within the healthcare system. So these would be like clinics, um, prescriptions for abortion pills, those types of things. And like, and then in 2020, it increased to 930,000 abortions. And this year in 2023, if the pace keeps like it has throughout the year, then we're, the nation is on track to have uh, a million and 22,000 abortions within Mm -hmm. the healthcare system. This does not count those that are happening outside of the healthcare system, which would be women ordering pills online and having them shipped in. And just from one, there's 20 sites that we know of that do that. And just from one of the sites, they reported that from September of 2021 to August of 2022, they had 42,000 requests from um, 30 different states. Um, Susan, you know, a, a lot of us became involved in um, kind of championing the pro-life movement when uh, we first became Christians or through our churches. And I know that uh, a church of mine uh, many years ago, about 20 years ago, supported the pro-life movement. I didn't know a thing about abolitionism. But what I've learned in the meantime is simply that the pro-life movement, you you win ground and you lose ground. It, it's uh, And it, it's been going on for decades and decades since R.V. Wade. And I think a lot of us are just simply tired of this game. It, it's like a big game. It doesn't even matter if you're pro-life. But if you're an abolitionist, this, this ends uh, the killing of babies. And I, um, tell me your thoughts about kind of the, that shift that you talked about earlier, the shift in, uh, why there are so many more, uh, people coming over to realize that uh, abolitionism is, is really the only thing that's going to work here. I think one of the things and one of the reasons that abolitionism is gaining ground is because people are actually hearing about it. So I mm-hmm. started in 1999 in the pro life movement when I was in middle school. And I had a cousin who got a position at the local pregnancy resource center. And so I would go there and volunteer. I would go to local um, events around 
our area and have the baby models and talk about baby models and fetal development and those types of things. And as time went on, that's all I knew to do. And then, you know, you support your local pregnancy resource center, you go to their banquets, you give money. Like I didn't really know there was anything else to do until 2016 when I was in a, I got kind of lost in Knoxville and I drove by Planned Parenthood and I was thought to myself, I didn't even know there was a Planned Parenthood in Knoxville. Like Mm -hmm. I had no idea. And their parking lot was full and I was wrecked. I, they had a prayer garden outside. I pulled my car over and I walked up and I just sobbed and sobbed and sobbed. Like what, like, what have I been doing thinking this is enough? And then in 2017, I was saved and then it just progressed. And I saw a storm comes rolling down the plane in 2021, which you've had Brett Baggett on. He was part of Mm -hmm. that documentary and that documentary gave me the language that I needed. It had, it was things that I knew were happening, things that didn't sit right. But when I watched that, it all made sense. And that is when I repented and I was all in uh, being an abolitionist because as a Christian, it was like, this is what we need. This is what the word of God says. And you, you cannot argue with it. Like if you argue with the abolitionist position, you're arguing against what scripture says. Yeah. And I was going to say too, that you mentioned your experience. I, we still called them crisis pregnancy centers went back when I volunteered. Yeah, me too. <laughs> and, and, but our uh, Planned Parenthood was right across the parking lot from, you know, and, and okay. one of them would, would always say, you know, that that's strategic. We're doing that because of the other guy. And it just, just, it was such a stark picture of of the light and the darkness that is this whole oh, entire issue, isn't it? I know. Yes, absolutely. Yeah. Well, um, continuing our, our discussion here about abolition and how it's new to a lot of people, you know, a lot of people have never heard of it before, like you said. Let's let's uh, hit a few little bullet points that, that uh, some people may not be aware of. They may not understand exactly what's involved. So let's talk about Equal protection. Now, a lot of people will hear that term and they don't really know what uh, abolitionists mean when they say that. So how about we we go through a few little bullet points here and start with equal protection. What is that? So equal protection is using the language of the 14th Amendment, which says that a state cannot deny a person within their jurisdiction equal protection of the laws. And so that would be like the legal term, and that's why we use that. But even more than legal and constitutional, it's biblical that you not that you shall not show partiality and judgment. You can't favor one group of people over another group of people when it comes to justice. So equal protection is the term that we use because that's what's in the Constitution. And it is saying this person, even though they're inside and you know, surviving on their mother while they're in the womb. They are a person just like we are, even though we are outside of the womb. And the same laws that protect us from being murdered should protect children in the womb from being murdered. And that is the very basic definition. Bradley Pierce, he's a constitutional attorney, but he works a lot in abolition. He says the murder of anyone should be illegal for everyone. And so that is really what equal protection is and the very basis of the abolitionist position. Right. Okay. How about um, this idea that we have seen so many times um, by the pro-life community saying that uh, women who seek abortions are victims. They're the second victim or they're the first victim mm-hmm. or whichever. And uh, and so they shouldn't be prosecuted. So wh- how would abolition answer that? So that actually happened again today when I was talking about that uh, pro-life group in Missouri, that was one of the things that they are saying that no pro-life person is for penalties for women when it comes to an abortion. And there are just like any crime that is committed. There are women who are victims of abortion, who are trafficked victims, who are drugged there under duress or coercion that would be victims. But the majority of people who are going into these abortion clinics ordering pills, they are simply doing it because they don't want to have a child for whatever reason. And the majority of them are not victims. Even in a crisis pregnancy center, there was a research report where women who had reached out to a Crisis. Now you have me saying crisis pregnancy center, Amy. (laughs) Sorry about (laughs) that. No, it's fine. The pregnancy resource center uh, 
they surveyed women who reached out to them for post abortive counseling and even women who proactively reached out to a pregnancy resource center. Only 10 percent of them said that they were coerced, but there was no definition of coercion given. So the the simple fact that the majority are victims, they are not. And then one of the things about our legal system is our legal system assumes that all people are victims. And then it is up to the government or the state to prove beyond a reasonable doubt that they are not. And the same thing would be in effect for women who uh, procure abortions. They, you know, they would say, can you prove beyond a reasonable doubt that this woman did this? And in many of the cases, it would be yes, especially anybody. We say this often who has spent time outside of abortion clinics I mean, when you've got people pulling up in like Mercedes and Range Rovers and I mean, it is not the even what the pro-life people paint it as, as desperate women with no other option and, you know, who can't support themselves. A couple of weeks ago at the in Bristol, which is where our closest meal is, there was um, like a fourth grade teacher from Nashville Mm. who drove over. And just didn't, you know, saying all kinds of horrible things, but she just didn't want to have a baby. So she drove over there to have her baby killed and then probably went back to teaching in a day or two. So the reality of it when you go to the clinics is very eye opening. Yes. So you touched you touched on this just a little bit um, about how women, you know, most of the women who go and get abortions or order the abortion pill or whatever are not victims. We've seen the the videos of women just shouting horrible things at um at abolitionists like that are on the sidewalk pleading with them and things mm. of this nature. So so this would you know some pro life people would you know say that prosecuting women who obtain abortions would there would be some some women and girls in that swath of prosecution I guess you could say who you know who had been forced to abort against their will and that mm-hmm. we don't want to prosecute women like that so you're saying that women who truly are victims you know would be treated just like any other um any anyone anyone else who is brought to court anyone who is accused they would be treated fairly when people are forced to commit crimes at gunpoint or whatever they're not they're not prosecuted. And so this would be, sort of mm-hmm. be the same thing for women and girls that are yeah, forced against their will. And then what about the issue of um, there's, you know, we've seen a lot of misinformation on this as well. Women who have miscarriages and ectopic pregnancies. And, you know, we've been, heard the propaganda that they'll be dragged into court and they'll be prosecuted as well. What about that? Which is simply fear mongering. The reason that they talk about Medically, the term for a miscarriage, and I've had one and remember seeing this on our medical papers, is a spontaneous abortion. Right. And a spontaneous abortion is very different from a surgical medical abortion. And so when we're talking about abortion, we're talking about what legally constitutes an abortion. And legally, a miscarriage does not constitute an abortion because it's a spontaneous abortion. And so they try to blur the lines between what, how it's regarded in the medical field than how it would be regarded legally. And legally, miscarriages are not abortions because abortions, as defined in law, would be the willful taking of a human life. And in all of the abortion laws, abortion is defined in the law. So whatever state you live in, whatever abortion laws there are on the record, it would legally define what an abortion is. And in no state does the legal definition of abortion apply to miscarriages or spontaneous abortions medically. Yeah. And then atopic pregnancies. So that is atopic pregnancies. Sometimes the child has, has already died by the time they find out there's an atopic pregnancy. And then sometimes that child um, has implanted and is still growing as far as they know. It's hard because you find atopic pregnancies at different times, but they're always very early in the pregnancy. And then in that situation, you're really dealing with two patients. How do we save two patients? Because atopic pregnancies can kill a mother because it will cause, you know, the fallopian tube to burst and internal bleeding, all things like that. And 
So it's a triage situation. No one came in saying, I want you to willfully and intentionally kill this child because I don't want it or whatever reason. And so there are, um, yeah, just a major difference. It, it aggravates me because I know women who have had atopic pregnancies and to think that what they have experienced um, would in any way equal what an abortion is, is it's just heart wrenching to me and for them as well that people are using their pain to say, oh, we can't, you know, we can't have laws against abortion because of a topic pregnancy. This that's just ludicrous. Yeah, I, I remember uh, when I uh, lost a child, um, a baby in in pregnancy, and I, I was crushed to see my medical record saying that it was a spontaneous abortion. I had never mm-hmm. heard that term before to describe a miscarriage, and I I just couldn't believe it. And when I hear women today, in in you know modern time, just just weeks ago, I heard somebody talking about that, saying that they were equating uh, a spontaneous abortion with the abortion evil practice of taking another life intentionally. And uh, it, it's just heartbreaking. So I think there's a lot of opportunity for education and for mm-hmm. trying to um, take the battle of the languages because uh, language words mean things. And yes. what we found is that when the other side is so adeptly uses the their oratory skills to uh, just uh, really push the the narrative here, uh, uh, we end up losing even more ground. So I, I think, how, mm-hmm. how, what is the best way that we can do that? How can, how can we educate ourselves to, uh, to what's been said and, and, you know, make that case for abolitionism? I think just being out in the culture, if someone realizes that abortion is legal in all 50 states for the pregnant woman, they are miles ahead of just your average person walking around. And if all of you, if all you know is the word of God and that, then you are well equipped to talk about this issue because so in Tennessee, and I would encourage people to look up what the, even if they're in an abortion free state, (laughs) as the pro-life movement says, look up what your law is to be able to talk about your state specific law. So when I'm interacting with people who think that Tennessee is abortion free, I will say, you know, do you realize this is what it states in the Tennessee Human Life Protection Act, which was our trigger law that was passed after Roe v. Wade was overturned. And so basically it says that a pregnant woman can use, and this is quoting right here, any instrument, medicine, drug, or any other substance or device with intent to terminate the pregnancy. That's what the law says. And then further down the law, because it exempts the woman from any legal penalties, it's saying that the pregnant woman can use any of those methods to end her pregnancy until birth. Yeah. And so you have to get people to understand that the laws are deceptive because you'll have all the definitions up here. And then at the very bottom of the law, it will have it was exempt from it or this this shall not be. Um, construed to have a pregnant woman with legal penalties. And and they all say some version of that. And so, yeah, I mean, truly, if you just know that, you know so much more than the average pro-life person out there. And then the word of God tells us how valuable children are when human life begins and that God does not want murder to go on legally in any way. So, and I feel like, Obviously, abortion is one of the reasons that judgment is raining down on this country is because of how many image bearers of God we have killed under the cover of law and still continue in every single state to murder under the cover of law. Yeah, absolutely tragic. And and you, you'll recall just a, a few months ago now, I believe it was in Texas, a, a woman uh, tried to, you know, she she took her case as far as she could to get uh, an abortion because she said that uh, the, the child was uh, had some uh, um developmental uh, disabilities of some kind, mm-hmm. uh, physical disabilities. And she uh, said that, you know, going on with this pregnancy would endanger her life. Um, that was initially ruled not true. It wasn't really going to endanger her life. Um, but that that whole, you know, uh, exception clause in there that we've had for many years in many states saying, you know, unless it's uh, to save the life of the woman, you know, uh, 
you know, this has been construed to be, you know, maybe she's got a, a, a mental depression that's going to happen if, if she continues the pregnancy, or maybe she'll have a headache or something like, that. I've never seen a case, uh, and, and maybe I'm just not savvy enough, but, but I've never seen a case where uh, a woman's life truly was in danger. Uh, it, the difference between giving birth to a baby and, uh, killing it in the womb, you would think that, that, you know, having a surgeon insert some kind of sharp instrument or, or a vacuum would yes. be much more dangerous than uh, giving birth. So uh, where yes. do we go with that? So life of the mother exceptions, there are, depending on the state that the abolition bill is written in, they look at what the homicide code is in that state and what it has for triage. So say you have You know, triage laws are like three people are in a car crash and you can only get two of them out before the car blew up. Okay, that's a triage situation and you can't go after somebody because that third person was left because all they had were two arms to carry people that those types of things are Mm -hmm. written into the homicide law. And if the homicide law would be clear that um, mothers in pregnancy or in hospital situations, triage that you know, it's not a homicide for them to deliver the baby early and the mother be there. It's a triage situation. And so there are some abolition bills that will have what people read as life of the mother exceptions, but they're really not. It generally is just clearing up the homicide law that's already there so that it's not mistaken. And then, but most states that you have, they already have laws like that. And so, people said, this doesn't even have an exception for life of the mother. Well, that's because there are triage laws in the homicide code that would automatically protect that woman from being, you know, prosecuted as for having an abortion. One of the, um, the things that's unique about the abolition movement, as we've been talking and, you know, discussing all these various aspects of it, one of the things that sort of sets it apart from the pro-life movement is the idea that we should work through the local church to abolish abortion. So therefore, you know, pastors and elders, men, of course, should be leading the charge. How does the biblical role of women in the church impact women's involvement in the abolition movement? For example, should women be leaders in the abolition movement? Are there certain abolition activities that women shouldn't take part in? So I will say that one thing that drew me another way to abolitionism is that it is led by men. Um, Generally, even if they're not serving as elders in their church, they are elder qualified men. Many of them are pastors. And I love that because you don't have like women clawing at each other and catfighting for powerful positions like you see in the uh, pro-life establishment. There are a couple of women who run organizations that would be abolitionist organizations, but that, so Imago Day would be one, not a victim would be one. But a huge part of what they do is reaching out to abortive minded or abortive active women in online chat rooms, in Facebook group posts, places where, you know, Reddit accounts, places where women are talking about trying to find information about abortion, which wouldn't be something we would recommend men do because men shouldn't be messaging women. Uh, yeah, right. privately or involved in these chat rooms. And so right. there are women, but the majority of your groups like Abolitionist Rising, your state abolitionist organizations are all led by men. So when I got into the abolitionist movement, I thought to myself, okay, I know I can't run an abolitionist organization. So I started praying that God would send somebody to start an abolish abortion in Tennessee. And while I was praying, I had the idea, well, how, what can I do to help these men that are leading the abolition movement? So I started doing a publication called Abolition News that just took very short, very concise. Here's what's been happening in abolition for this amount of time. Here are the links. Here's the articles. Here's the podcast. Here's the YouTube videos, those types of thing. And that was really where well received because many of the pastors, they're like, I don't have time to keep up with all of abolitionism. This is so helpful. And so I did that until God thankfully brought us a man to start and lead a Bosch abortion, Tennessee, which happens to be my pastor. So very thankful for that. So much opportunity to do exactly what you're doing. Are there other things that women can do uh, through their churches or maybe a, a para ministry of some kind that uh, would uh, be helpful? Uh, for instance, if there was something that uh, maybe like up here in Wisconsin, I don't see any uh, abolition uh, movements up here or groups. But I'm, I'm sure there are some. I just don't find them very easy I just by doing a Google search. Mm-hmm. Yeah, there is a website on abolitionist rising 
they have a directory of abolitionist organizations by state. Not every state has one, but if your state has one, then it's on there. And as far as women involvement, so you have two kind of categories at women, right? You have women who are like me, who are moms, young children, trying to keep our, you know, everything organized and our heads above water. And then you have those that are single, maybe they're not married yet, or those who are empty nesters. And it looks different depending on what type of point in life that you are on. And so for me, and especially for my sister, because she has three children and just has one that's two months old. And so very Uh small, the, the, the best thing to do is number one, pray. It doesn't matter what stage of life that you are on. This is a biblical movement. We believe in the power of prayer. So just pray for the abolition of abortion. And then one of the really simple things is get gear And so they sell abolitionists rising and other places sell gear for abolition that have all kinds of slogans. And I have been stopped multiple times. Like, I like your hoodie. I like your sweatshirt. Can you tell me more about this? Where'd you get this? I want to buy some. So there's been definitely conversations to be had just while you're out the grocery store or at your kid's basketball game that start conversation. Another thing that anybody can do, we call it drop carding or seeding the culture. And so they're little uh, index size cards or some of them are the size of business cards that have, like we have ones that are specific to abolish abortion, Tennessee. There's some that are specific with abolitionists rising again, because they're the, they're where I get a lot of my merch from. And you can leave them in credit card readers in gas station. I leave them at the pump all the time in bathroom stalls in the aisle when you're going down the grocery store. My son loves to (laughs) seed when we're at the grocery store. So we always take in cars and then he decides where to put them as we're shopping. So that, that is very easy, practical things to do no matter how old you are. Sharing social media posts, talking with people in your real life, donating to abolitionist organizations. I mean, there's you know, it doesn't matter what stage of life you're in there. Those are very simple things that people can do. Uh, thank you. And I, I did, uh, as we were talking here, I just looked up the uh, Abolitionists Rising site. It is very good. I, I have not been here before. And uh, Susan I and ladies in Wisconsin here, there there is no such abolition bill in Wisconsin, but all the links mm-hmm. to uh, the, the state legislature, current bills, the, all, all the contact information where you can, you know, be a little bit more active if you want to be. We'll, we'll have those in the show notes today. Yeah, absolutely. I think we'll we'll try to provide our listeners with as many resources as we possibly can and links where they can get involved. We touched a little bit on various stages of life. And uh, what about women who do have a little bit more time on their hands to get more actively involved? Are there uh, are there other things that they can do that might, you know, where they could might take a little more active role? So the number one thing would probably be talking to legislatures in they're whoever their local representatives are, because like I said, I think about my sister going with her three kids and trying to talk to a legislature or to go to Nashville to talk to somebody, it would just be chaos. And so those that don't have that to talk to their legislators about them, to try to find somebody who is on board with equal protection. Uh, There was a woman who's an empty nester that I saw on social media the other day. She had a watch party for her Sunday school class for a storm comes rolling down the plane to kind of show them, you know, what she had been talking about. She made snacks and things. And so in that type of life, we don't have little kids that are running around and people aren't trying to hire babysitters. You know, you can do education that type of way, ministering outside the abortion meal. Generally, what it, wherever the abortion meal is, there's people who regularly go. So just finding those groups, if it's within driving distance, to go help minister with them. Um, and then, like I said, if your state has an abolition group, to get involved involved there. But those those would be the things that are much easier to do when there are not little ones running around. So yeah, that's true. And and also, I think to to uh, bring our pastors up to speed too. If our pastors don't yes. know what abolition is, and maybe kind of try and get them on board as well, and and uh, inspire them and and uh, get them excited about abolition as well, uh, because they really can they really can turn the the church that direction as well. So I think that would probably maybe be something that it, people with any amount of time on their hands could probably do. So that would be good. That would be good. All right, Susan, as we wrap things up, is there anything else that you'd like to share with our listeners about abolition or how they can get involved? 
I think we've covered the majority of things. If anybody is, like I said, more specific, please go to your state organization for abolition. If your state does not have one, then you can reach out to Abolitionist Rising and they can help you or help pray with you if you're a woman until God raises up a man um, to lead this charge in your state. That's what I had to do. I simply prayed. And then when our new pastor came after our other one retired, I talked to him about abolition. He'd never heard of it. I just gave him the materials. I let the word of God do the work. And a few months later, he said, wow, okay, I'm an abolitionist and we need to do something about this. And so, yeah. And so God will, like he more than anybody wants this abolished. And so he, I just feel like he will work when his people are seeking to bring it into it. And it's so simple, something that all of us can do. We can pray, we can uh, set forth mm-hmm. materials, uh, very, very easy and very effective mm-hmm. as well. It has been so great to have you on the show, Susan. We're going to put links in the show notes uh, to where people can find you. But why don't you give those now? Uh, where can people find you online? Uh, so my twin sister and I, we run Steadfast Women is our main account. And you can find us. We have Steadfast Women on Facebook, Instagram, and X, formerly Twitter. <laughs> and we have a website, steadfastwomen.org. And then as a branch off of Steadfast Women, we have Abolition Women. And that is only on Instagram and X. But there is a tab for Abolition Women on our Steadfast Women website. And so they can message us through any of those types of direct messaging systems that they want to. Happy to talk with people about this subject and whatever they would want to discuss, we're free to discuss it because the abolitionist movement needs to grow. So. It sure does. Yes and amen. Well, Susan, thank you so much for being with us today. I know this has been so, so helpful for our listeners. Yes, thank you. Thank you both as well. Well, listeners, what did you think? Did you learn something new about abortion abolition? What is one holy habit about abolition that you could implement in your own life in the days to come? Why don't you leave us a comment on social media or over on our website and uh, let us know your thoughts about today's episode. Yeah, and don't forget to check out our website, awordfitlyspoken.life. Did you know that on our website, you can learn all about Amy and me and what we believe? Just click on the About tab and the Belief tabs. We also have um, some super helpful websites listed for you at our Resources tab. And also, if you'd like to help us defray the costs of podcasting, be sure to visit the Donate tab. And until next time, let's all work to end abortion now and walk worthy. Walk worthy.